Hello, welcome to second video on uh, Mr. Gill's science stuff. Thanks to those people who got in touch about the last one. Um, we're trying this with the webcam version and the screen capture version today uh, to get rid of that little interleaving issue. I hope it's better. If you like this better, then let me know. If you want to go back to the other one, then also let me know. So, uh, this is an A-level video on species and taxonomy. Uh, we're going to cover a number of things today. So we should be able to start quite easily from last time with looking at this picture. So this uh, Ulva prolifera produces haploid, mobile, single cells that confuse the things form a zygote, suggest and explain one reason why successful reproduction between proliferia and lac lactuca, never any good the Latin, does not happen. So what they're asking you to do there is they're telling you this has nothing to do with meiosis. So these are, va these are viable haploid single cells that can indeed form a zygote. But what they're showing you there is the Latin names, and as you probably know from GCSE, what you should spot is they are not the same species. So that's the, the answer to this question. They're not the same species, so if they're fused together, they would not make fertile offspring. And that's basically where we're picking up today, which is pretty much where we left off last time with the idea of a species. So, here's the syllabus. As you can see, uh, you need to know a lot of the same stuff as you knew for GCSE. You've got your uh, binomial, you've got courtship behaviour, you've got phylogenetic trees. So there's a little bit more about the evolutionary origins, a little bit more about the genetics and all that kind of stuff. Interestingly, you are not expected to talk about the three domain system, which you were at GCSE. That is obviously still true, it still exists, it's just the a -level syllabus has chosen not to focus on that. Okay. So, this is what we're going to cover, the species concept, courtship behaviour, binomial naming, phylogenetic classification, classification hierarchy of taxa, and appreciating that modern techniques uh, help clarify, uh, modern techniques help clarify relationships, basically DNA and genetics. So, this is our species concept that we talked about last lesson, a group of individuals is genetically similar enough to reproduce and produce reproductively viable offspring. That means that two individuals can reproduce and then the offspring can also be produced as well. There are of course varieties within one species, a lot of genetic variation, so if you wanted to have a little look into why it is that um, bacteria don't really fit this uh, definition, that would be a useful piece of extension. Please let me know what you find out. So the question for today really is when does variation reach a point that we've not got to uh, one species yet. When does variation become a species and how do we know? How do we name these organisms and how do we put them into categories? So these uh, organisms here are clearly the same species. You've got tulips and you've got dogs. They can both, within the pictures, uh, produce viable offspring, although as you can see with the dogs, they would require uh, an awful lot of help in terms of IVF to do that for purely mechanical reasons. Okay, and you can use your imagination there. But they would definitely be able to produce viable offspring, fertile offspring, if they needed to, okay? Uh, if they were given some assistance. So the question really is at what point does um, variety, does variation become different species? So that's one of the main questions for today. When does variation reach a point that speciation is actually taking place? So there are always edge cases. We as humans are always trying to put things into categories, trying to make things uh, work with our systems. But of course, biology doesn't work that way. Biology is a continuous spectrum, and there are, of course, many edge cases. Famous ones, for example, like the liger, which is a lion father, tiger, mother. Right? They all just come out enormous for some reason, very, very, very large animals. I mean, that, that lady standing up. So, uh, moving on, you've got the tigon, tiger father, lion mother, um, zeboids. So, there's various different uh, hybrids you can make with horses, donkeys. A zebra, that kind of stuff, we reproduce with each other. That one there just looks like a donkey in socks to me, but there we go. And of course, the most famous one is the mule. So, a male donkey, female horse. So, these uh, exist, but the reason they're not fertile is a different number of chromosomes. So, a horse with 66 chromosome, donkey 62. So, when they come to pair up, then you can get an organism that can live, but is not reproductively viable. It's not fertile, it can't make its own gametes. So, it fills the first half of the definition, but not the second. So that's what happens in most of these hybrids. They are not fertile, therefore the parents are not the species. Ligers and tigons are a bit of an exception because we are discovering they do retain some fertility and you can back cross them sometimes with, um, with other lions or tigers, which suggests that our whole definition 
of a lion and a tiger as a as different species is actually flawed, and they're just the same cat in a different jacket. Okay? So, how do the organisms know? How do the organisms tell this is an organism that's going to produce viable offspring if I breed with them? Well, one uh, way they know that, of course, major way they know that is courtship behaviour. So, this example here, the peacock, is probably the most famous example of courtship behaviour. The big tail on the peacock showing the female this is the, the big, fit, uh, reproductively viable male. Okay? So, courtship behaviour has got to do a number of different things. Okay? Uh, it might sound obvious, and it's always hilarious to liken these to human courtship behaviour, but I'll leave that to your own imaginations to do. Okay? So to make it successfully, these are the things that an animal has to be able to do. Firstly, they've got to be able to recognise their own species. That sounds pretty obvious, one would hope that all organisms can recognise their own species, but in very crowded ecosystems, where there's maybe 100 species of beetle, 100 species of spider, a load of different species of very similar birds, all that kind of stuff, They've actually got to be able to recognise their own species. Or in the ocean, where whales communicate over huge distances by sound, but lots of different whale species are doing that, they've got to be able to recognise which one is actually their species. Okay, without actually able to see them, just by sound. Approaching without aggression. Lots of organisms are very, very solitary. They don't um, work well uh, in groups, so I'm thinking tigers, for example. Generally, if two wild tigers meet, they're going to fight, either over territory or over food. Uh, they've got to have some method of approaching one another and signalling that this is for mating purposes, not for fighting. Okay? So that's quite an uh, important part of courtship behaviour. You've got to be able to choose a strong and healthy mate. Okay, that there is uh, the most reported. If you watch any nature documentary ever, you will see a million different ways, from dances to, uh, to fighting between individuals, to plumage, to songs, to all sorts of different things to demonstrate which is the strongest and healthiest individual to reproduce with. Loads of different examples of that. And of course, they've got to be able to synchronise their mating behaviour. So they've got to be able to do this at the same time. Okay, It's no good having your mating song singing from the top of a tree with all of your uh, mating plumage, breeding plumage on, and it's the middle of winter and there's no other birds around. That would be hopeless. Okay, uh, As we're filming this in March, you can stick your head out the window and actually hear the reproductive songs, you can hear the mating songs of uh, all the birds, the wild birds, out in the environment seeking out mates as it is. I don't think you just heard that. There's Omani wandering in there. So, um, the most famous example here is Birds of Paradise, of course. So, the uh, Birds of Paradise are beautiful, spectacular individuals in uh, Papua New Guinea, Indonesia. Um, that's an environment where they've had relatively little predation, relatively little uh, competition for food, so really the only thing that drives their evolution is competition for mates and for breeding. So what they've ended up with is this variety of species that have the most spectacular plumage, the most spectacular dances, the most spectacular songs, the most spectacular nets, uh, all these wonderful, wonderful ways of attracting a mate. So I'm putting two links to two videos in the description. Please do pause at this point and have a look at those. Uh, it's well worth your time. There's also loads more out there on YouTube that you can have a look at. Done that? Good. Right, let's move on. So, how then do we come along as humans and actually name these organisms? So biology, as we said, doesn't actually sit very nicely in our, um, in our little boxes. Right? It doesn't fit very well. So what has to happen is we have to come up with some kind of system to try and make sense of all this chaos. So that subject of being able to do that is taxonomy. So a good taxonomic system has got, got to have a couple of features. Generally, it's got to have uh, smaller groups inside larger groups, so a hierarchy. So we can group all these organisms over here, and within that group is this group, and within that group is this group, this group, this group. And going down, they must be non-overlapping. So one organism can't be in two groups. So uh, I'll give you the example of the ductile platypus there. It uh, has fur, so we call it a mammal, but it also lays eggs, so it might be considered a reptile. We can't have it in both groups, so for various physiological and anatomical uh, reasons, on balance we decided it's a mammal, not a reptile, despite the fact it lays eggs, doesn't have live young like most other mammals. So that's a good taxonomic system. But it doesn't always work, there are always going to be edge cases, there are always going to be exceptions. So, how do we name organisms? This is what we call a binomial system. This is a fossilised snake, uh, the first hugging creature, 
in the world from Brazil's um, just the shaped up solution. Uh, so there's the, the picture of what it should uh, look like. It's very, very old, obviously very in the fossil record, but it illustrates nicely what we should be doing with this name. Okay, so this name, uh, tetrapo, tetrapo, I'm always terrible with the Latin, um, has italics, which obviously type, uh, type the, typing it out, you always use it italics. Uh, the first name, the genus name, always has an uppercase letter. Second name, the species name, doesn't. Okay, so that's the, the rule for making a binomial uh, system. So every organism has a binomial name, its genus, its species, written like that. Good bit of pub quiz trivia knowledge for you here. Uh, can you think of the only organism on the planet whose Latin binomial name is exactly the same as its English name? I'm not, think, not talking about things that have a repeat, so a gorilla being called Gorilla Gorilla. No, no, exactly the same. Okay, uh, let me know the answer to that question and I'll include you in the next video or something. So, moving on. So, the binomial system, as we said, the first word uh, is the organism's genus. It should have a capital letter, start the word. Second one is a separate word with the species and has a small letter. So, if you're typing this, it should be typed in italics. But if you're handwriting a species name in an exam, an essay of any sort, uh, you can't do italics, obviously. It should be underlined to illustrate this is a species name. Right, so the, the system that we use most is a system of taxonomy uh, invented by a guy called Carl Linnaeus, who was a Swedish botanist who decided to try and come up with a system that could make sense of all the chaos around in the world. So he came up with this system where he decided all organisms should be divided first into kingdoms, then into phyla, then into classes, then into order, then into family, then into species. These were his taxa. Okay? You are expected to know those words right, and how they go in order and spot that the last two, the genus and the species, are the binomial name. Okay? Um, he did this all in Latin. This was not just to be difficult and just to be smug. This is because when he was working, if you were educated at all in the world, you learned Latin. So he was trying to be universal. And also it's a language that doesn't change. It's a language that is uh, it's pretty static because people don't speak it these days. So it can be universal and static to name animals. Now, of course, since his um, era, right, uh, since his era, it's come on a little bit, right, so we've actually added um, some bits to it, a bit of that in a moment. You need a way of remembering this, okay? I was always taught this by my A level teachers, KP Crisps are fantastically good saltiness, but you don't see KP Crisps around very much anymore. In fact, you didn't back then either, uh, so you might want to come up with your own one. And as I say, if you think the Latin is difficult, I think he could have done this in Swedish, he could have done this in his own language, uh, which would have meant we would have had the whole of life sounding like an IKEA catalogue. So instead of a Homo sapien, we might have had a Sultan um, Hugh. So, you know, he was trying to be considerate. So, come up with a system that you can use to remember kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. There is now, of course, another layer. Now we understand things in the cellular level. And thinking back to GCSE, the three domain system, uh, we've got to put them atop domain, which rather ruins my. Um, my mnemonic there, so I just decided to swap that and put a DEM, DEM KP crisps of fantastically good saltiness, which of course you can use if you want, but you can also come up with your own ones. Right, a couple of examples, so this one here, so this is the uh, sort of taxonomic classification of you, you should know very well that Homo sapiens, H. sapiens, is a human. So what can we tell from this? Animalia, it's an animal, Chordata, a backbone, Mammalia, it's a mammal, it's all the pictures of mammals, Primates, Primate, hominidae, upright walking ape, and then Homo sapiens. So it is you. It's a human. Okay? So this one, again, you should recognize E. coli because we don't tend to have common names very much for bacteria. We tend to just use the Latin names. Uh, but you can tell a few things about that. Entero, right? Uh, it means to do with the gut in there. And coli is sort of derived from colon, as in where the natural habitat of these bacteria are. Um, monora, mono, single living, individual bacteria. Um, these ones here obviously have a very, very broad name. E. coli is a very, very broad term in terms of genetic differences. Uh, since doing a lot of sequencing, we found out that E. coli can be up to 70% genetically different from each other and still called E. coli. For reference, you are only 50% genetically different from a cabbage. So that's a very, very, very broad species name. And this is one way where modern technology has actually given us far more information about these, uh, these organisms. So, moving on then. This one you might not recognise, but you should be able to work something out about uh, Animalia, Arthropod, 
the old segmented body thing, insector, right? It's an insect, so it's got six legs, of course. Um, and then if you don't recognize Drosophila uh, as, a, as, a, as a type of organism, it's actually one of the most studied organisms on the planet, and it is a fruit fly. Those little annoying things that buzz around a fruit bowl when you've left your bananas in there too long. Right? They're one of the most studied organisms on the planet. They're used as a model for eukaryotic genetics and neurobiology, that kind of thing. Um, and there's a lot of work that goes on in terms of Alzheimer's, in terms of uh, all that kind of stuff. So, two main methods of classification, old-fashioned, new. So artificial classification essentially does this thing look like that thing. You can imagine Darwin's been away for five years, he's put a lot of stuff in jars, he's brought them back, he's given them to various experts and they're sort of measuring things and looking at stuff um, to see where they fit. But unfortunately it doesn't reflect evolutionary origins. So butterflies and birds have both got wings for flight, but we wouldn't actually have put them in the same group, of course, right? So phylogenetics tries to look at shared features from common ancestors. So actually based on evolutionary relationships and arranges groups into a hierarchy which are contained within larger groups with no overlap, as we've already mentioned. So we're trying to move towards phylogenetics using DNA evidence and actually finding that there's been an awful lot of mistakes throughout history in terms of our classification. Reason for this and um, this is a little bit of extension, is the idea that organisms over time, if they're living in the same environment, even if they come from very, very different backgrounds, can convergently evolve to live in the same environment. Okay? So it might be that that way of getting resources from that environment is just the best way to do it, so different organisms from different backgrounds would have evolved the same. So I'll give you an example. So for example, um, sharks. Sharks and dolphins, you might think, are quite similar. Um, if you look at them at a very cursory level, the idea they're grey, swimmy, bitey, chasey, fishy things. Um, and, you know, fair enough, they are, but that's just the best way to survive in that environment. In fact, they are incredibly different in terms of their uh, evolutionary history. So, dolphins are more related to us, they are mammals. Sharks predate bony fish and don't even have a skeleton. Right? So they've just evolved some of the similar structures to survive in the same environment. So for that reason, we try and use DNA, right? particularly sections that are non-coding, right? uh, and look at the similarities and differences of analogous genes and different species to work out our genetic relatedness. So that's basically all we've got to do today. Um, I'll leave you with this to illustrate that issue of the problem between the old-fashioned classification and the new. So the red here is our uh, names for different canids, different uh, animals, so like dogs, wolves, coyotes, jackals, that kind of stuff. And as you can see, there's a lot of things in there called dog and fox and wolf and all that, uh, all that sort of thing. However, when you look at the blue lines, which are the evolutionary relationship when they speciated how many millions of years ago, you can see that they don't always line up. Okay, and I encourage you to pause this and have a little look at that diagram and spot some of the anachronisms and the bits that don't actually make sense. Okay, so what have we covered today? We've revised the species concept, we've looked at the uh, sort of courtship behaviour as a way of finding a uh, mate we can make it successfully, we've looked at how we then come along and put our names and our classification systems on, what a good classification system should do, and how modern technology is allowing us to get a better taxonomy and, and point out some of the mistakes of our past. Okay, so uh, let me know if this is a better system, worse system, otherwise, uh, and I will... See you next time. Bye.